Okay, well, we have hit the 1030 mark. So if everybody's ready to go, I think we will get started. Sound good? Ready. Okay, great. So thank you so much to all of you for joining us. Uh, this is uh, the first time that we have done an event like this, of this type of scale over Zoom. So we are um, very, very excited for you to join us. But more than anything, we just really want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your morning uh, to learn a little bit more about the WP Carey School of Business. We have a, a great morning and into the early afternoon for you um, to hear from our award-winning faculty, to learn about our graduate programs, as well as how to apply, how to make the most out of your career, and, uh, and how to finance as well. We also have a number of our alums joining us today, so a huge thanks to you as well. Um, we'll get started, so if we want to move to the next slide, we'll just go over a couple of our housekeeping tips. So for those of you on the call, you have been muted, and uh, your, both your camera and your microphone have been muted. That's just in an effort to reduce any background noise, as well as reduce any um, distractions. If you can hear us, it's, I think that we have established that we can, but if a couple of you can just type yes into the chat box, that'll give us some practice in the chat box as well, uh, just to confirm that you can hear us. I see those yeses coming through. Thank you so much. So if you do have any difficulty, um, you can reach out to um, Avnet, and that is our, that's one of the users here. That is our on-site help uh, who, can, who can get you some help there. Please feel free also to put any uh, questions whatsoever that you have right into the chat box. Um, if we do have time, we'll have some questions for um, Professor Ling at the end. If we don't, this is how that will function when you do move into our breakout sessions. So if we move forward, um, I'll first start by introducing myself. So I am your moderator throughout the day. My name is Rebecca Mallon Churchill. I'm the Director of Graduate Student Recruitment here at the W.P. Carey School of Business. I am joining you today from my, uh, from my house. Everyone except our, our skeleton crew there at Avnet in uh, McCord Hall is joining it from their homes. And we are happy for you to join us as well. Certainly hope that you're remaining safe and healthy. Uh, I want to take just a few moments to introduce a few members of our team. So we have our recruitment team. So on our next slide, you see uh, our full-time team. So if you are interested in our full-time MBA program, these are the folks who would be helping you throughout that process. We have Joanna, Stephen, who is on the call, and Hunter on the call today. Next, we have our professional programs team. So Naomi, Eric, Brandy Niemeyer, and Brandy Carruthers. So if you are looking into one of our programs that you can complete while working full time, uh, then this is definitely one of the folks who you'll want to chat with. And then for our specialized master's team, we do have um, on the next slide, we've got Shalise, Amy, and then Kylie, who can help you if you are looking at one of our programs that is gonna dive really particularly deep into one subject. And as I had mentioned before, uh, for our alums coming back for our back to class, you are working with Brennan and Teresa. A huge thank you so much to our alums for joining us this morning and uh, remaining engaged with the WP Carey family. I think that what we'll hear from Don is gonna be very, very timely. So um, we are definitely excited to, uh, to welcome you back as well. So to go on to the next slide, just a couple things about our agenda today. If you can see that our first hour is gonna be spent with our award-winning faculty who's gonna talk about a lot of really, really important things. And then we will be moving into our breakout sessions. So uh, these breakout sessions, they're gonna start at 1130. There are four sessions and each of them are going to run uh, three times in a row. So they are 20 minutes a piece with a five minute break in between. And there are room for you to attend three of those. So we'll have breakout sessions on our MBA programs. So if you know that you're interested in an MBA program, that is going to cover all of the different modalities as well as the differences and differentiators. If you are not interested in an MBA and you want to focus in on one of our specialized master's programs, you'll want to attend that breakout session. So that will give you a, a pretty broad overview of those. We'll also have a session led by our Associate Director of Financial Services on financing your degree. And then our Director of Career Management is joining us for advancing your career. So again, those are 20 minutes a piece. Those nine digit numbers are the Zoom meeting IDs. So probably not a bad idea if you wanna go ahead and just take a quick uh, camera shot, snapshot, something like that of this screen. Um, or of course, if you do have the 
email or the agenda that we sent out to you yesterday. You can just follow those Zoom links. For the end of the breakout sessions at 1 p.m., we can all meet back in this open chat room. And then that is going to be an opportunity to just get any questions whatsoever answered uh, for you that wasn't covered throughout any of your other breakout sessions. Um, we, of course, uh, with this, this event that we typically do on campus, we have our ambassadors as a part of it. So they are um, not a part of it today, but we're always happy to connect you with our current students. So just let us know if that's something that you're interested in as well. So on the next slide, you'll see just a, um, a quick little overview as far as how to um, follow these Zoom instructions. I think many of us who have transitioned to working remotely have become uh, Zoom experts over this last week. Um, but if it is new to you, it's very simple. So you can either follow those links in the agenda or you can just visit zoom.com, click on join a meeting, and then you can just enter that nine digit uh, meeting ID number that we provided there for you. So without further ado, we are gonna go and kick it off. So I am delighted to be able to introduce our faculty speaker today. Uh, Don Lang joined W.P. Carey in 2006 after receiving his PhD in management from the McComb School of Business at the University of Texas at Austin. He is an associate professor of management and entrepreneurship and the Lincoln Professor of Management Ethics. His research interests include bad behavior within organizations, corporate social responsibility and irresponsibility, organizational reputation and stakeholder strategies. So again, really excited to hear his talk today and ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Don Ling. <laughs> thanks, um, thanks everybody. Uh, this is a very strange situation for me to be in. My live audience here consists of exactly two people who are, I'm gonna say six feet, maybe six feet and a half uh, from each other. So. That's what we're doing with here. Everybody else is my virtual audience, so welcome. Uh, it's, um, this is a strange situation. Uh, we, uh, things have been moving so fast, so, so rapidly. It's, uh, it was just a couple weeks ago that I started making notes for this presentation, and at that time I didn't intend to say anything about the coronavirus. And here we are, and I've adjusted my plans a little bit because I, I will be saying a little bit about it, but. Um, as you can see from the title of my talk, How Not to Strike Out at Ethical Decision Making, I'm looking at you, Houston Astros. The subject of the talk is about baseball. Uh, remember when we used to have baseball in this country? Um, well, that's still the subject of the talk, and I hope that this, uh, I hope this is a welcome distraction for you, uh, that uh, maybe it'll take your mind a little bit about what's going off, uh, going on in our in our nation and in the world. But I do promise that I'm going to circle back at the end and talk about um, just a few words about some thoughts about ethics in the time of a pandemic. So, um, yeah, I want to start off by actually talking about philosophy and a question that moral philosophers uh, have talked about forever, and it's a moral dilemma, and it goes like this. Would you steal a loaf of bread to feed your starving family? Would you steal a loaf of bread to feed your starving family? It's a dilemma because you can't do both. You can't both steal the bread and not steal the bread. It's a moral dilemma because whichever you choose to do, it has strong moral implications. If you steal the bread, it has moral implications. If you don't steal the bread and your family starves, uh, it has moral implications. So uh, moral philosophers have uh, come up with basically three different approaches to this kind of really tricky dilemma. Considering what are your duties, considering what are the consequences of your behavior, and considering what virtues you want to have, what kind of person you want to be, what kind of attributes you want to have, what kind of person you want to live up to be. So let's talk about each of those. Uh, the first, figuring out where your duties lie. Um, this is trying to, this is trying to um, 
understand what the rules, the moral rules for behavior are that are, that are so widely understood and so strong that you would be grossly irresponsible if you didn't follow them. So if we're looking at this duties approach to this very question, would you steal a loaf of bread to feed your starving family? You might, if you came to the yes answer, you might think that your duties are in fact to protect the vulnerable, to watch out for your family, to maybe to be a good parent, and that your duties would in fact drive you to yes, steal the loaf of bread to feed your starving family. On the other hand, you might see your duties line in a different way. You might see your duties as um, not stealing, protecting the property rights of others. And in that case, considering where your moral duties lie might drive you to no, not steal the bread. These are rules for behavior. So when you consider this question, where would your duties lie? The second approach that moral philosophers use when they think about this question, would you steal a loaf of bread to feed your starving family, is the consequences approach. And here you don't consider the rules for behavior. You don't consider where your duties lie. Instead, you, you try to figure out who's affected by your decision and you try to figure out whether they're helped or harmed, who is helped or harmed. So this is all about consequences and you might even find yourself needing to break a moral rule in order to achieve the right consequences. So if you think about this question about stealing the bread to feed your starving family with a consequences approach, so you might be thinking about two possible affected parties. One is the baker and one is your fan, the other is your family. And thinking about the fact that if you do steal the bread, uh, yes, it's going to create hardship for the baker, but, the, but it's way outweighed by the idea that your family won't starve. And if that's your calculation, if that's how you balance this then you might come to the yes question. Yes, um, even though it's a hardship for the baker, yes, you must steal the bread because the consequences demand it. Now, you might look at this, you might look at the balance a different way and you say, you might say, no, the harm to the baker is actually great and greater than the good that would come from uh, giving the bread to my family. And if that's how the balance looks to you, then you would come down in the no answer. Now, the third approach doesn't consider the, your, where your duties lie, and it doesn't consider what the consequences of your actions are. Rather, it considers what kind of person do you want to be? What kind of attributes do you want to have? What kind of virtues do you want to have? And so the idea here is that you've thought in advance about the kind of person that you want to be. You've already established that. And then when a difficult moral dilemma comes up, you choose which way to act based on which of the choices best lives up to that person you've already decided you want to be. So maybe you've decided that you want to be somebody who's courageous and maybe loyal to those people who count on you. And if that's the case, maybe this virtues question um, suggests to you that, yes, you, st you should steal the bread because that's the kind of person that I want to be. Or um, Maybe, maybe you look at it a different way. Maybe the virtues that you want to have are things like being selfless and sacrificing. And in that case, um, living up to who you want to be might lead you to say, no, um, I'm not the kind of person who, who would steal the bread. Now, um, these are the three primary ways that moral philosophers think about looking at um, a difficult moral dilemma like this. Uh, but what does that have to do with the Major League Baseball's 2017 World Series champions, the Houston Astros? Now, you might know, and maybe you don't, that this team is in a lot of hot water. And before we consider the ethics of the situation, I think it might be good to talk about exactly what they did so that we can 
make sure that we're all on the same page. If you're an avid baseball fan, or if you know nothing about baseball, or if you're somewhere in between, we'll all get on the same page. So uh, I can point out to you that the core activity in the game is the batter who's standing 60 feet, six inches from the pitcher and trying to hit a baseball with a bat. That's the core activity. It's often considered to be one of the hardest feats in professional sports, hitting a Major League Baseball's pitch. Well, pitchers do everything they can to fool the batter. And one way they do this is by changing the speed that the pitch is coming. So one pitch might be coming at a leisurely 85 miles an hour, and when the next pitch comes at over 100 miles an hour. In addition to um, changing speeds, pitchers are able to change the path that the ball follows as it approaches the batter. And this is just some examples of the different kind of pitches that pitchers throw. Not every pitcher throws all of these pitchers, but every major league pitcher has some repertoire of these different pitches so they can change the pitches that they're throwing. And again, with the purpose of fooling with fooling the batter. So they do this by adjusting the grip on the ball and the way they deliver the ball. I wanted to give you a good sense of how this works. So here we have you Darvish, who at the time was pitching, at the time of this video clip, was pitching for the uh, LA Dodgers. And here he's pitching against one of the better hitters in Major League Baseball, Albert Pujols of the Los Angeles Angels. And this clip I'm gonna show you through the magic of, of editing has overlaid five of you Darvish's pitches on top of each other. And what's really interesting about this, you can see that his motion doesn't look very different in these different pitches, but the different pitches follow five different paths. So here we go. I'll let that repeat. This is filmed in slow motion, of course, but if, imagine if you're Albert Pujols and you're trying to figure out which, of, which pitch is coming at you. And now you can see why it's such a difficult challenge for to hit a major league baseball pit, pitcher's pitches. Behind the plate, we have the catcher. And the catcher's doing more than just catching the ball. And he's orchestrating a complex game plan, um, deciding what pitch to throw when. And he's communicating throughout the game with the pitcher. But of course he has to do that secretly so that the batter doesn't know what the next pitch is gonna be. He's communicating with, with hand signs. And this is what this looks like. Secret hand signs between the, the pitcher and the, and the catcher. Now, the Houston Astros are one of 30 teams in Major League Baseball. And these 30 teams are divided into the American League and the National League. And in a, um, in a, a typical non-corona year, we would have a long summer season where these teams play each other. And then at the end of the season, at the end of playoffs, two champions would emerge, an American League champion and a National League champion. And those two champions play each other in the World Series. And in 2017, the American League champion, Houston Astros beat the, uh, the National League champ champions, the LA Dodgers to attain that all important title, the World Series champion title. Okay, so that's the background, but what's the controversy? What's the controversy here? And basically it comes down to sign stealing. Now I showed you this really excellent picture. I showed you a clip of him just now, you Darvish. And I told you at the time he was pitching for the LA Dodgers. Well, he pitched in this World Series. He pitched two games in this series. And both games, he did horrible. This excellent pitcher did horrible, meaning that the batters were hitting his pitches left and right. He couldn't seem to fool them. It was almost as if the batters knew what pitch was coming. And it turns out that in fact, they did. We now have um, definitive evidence and it's been definitively determined 
that the Houston Astros in both the 2017 season and the 2018 season used video camera technology. They had a video camera posted in the outfield of their home baseball park that would look right at the catcher who was giving those secret signs, send the video feed to a monitor where Astros players were watching the monitor and decoding the signs and then a common way of communicating to the batter what the next pitch would be was banging on a trash can. So an audible, an audible code. Now I wanna take these ideas that I introduced earlier, this idea of duties and consequences and virtues and use it to think about this Astros situation. Um, in doing so, what I wanna do, and the purpose of this is to offer you a, an easy to remember framework for thinking through an ethical situation, an ethical decision situation. So this, this framework has four questions, four pretty easy to remember questions, and um, here they are. But by the way, I, wanted, I want you to notice that when I present this, this four question framework that I've divided it into obligations and opportunities. And we often think about ethical situations as threats, as um, a need to be defensive and to make sure we go don't get into trouble. We do that by making sure we've met our obligations. But I also want to point out that an ethical decision uh, uh, situation has within it, uh, within it the uh, uh, opportunities. Um, I, I think somebody might have turned their mic on. Make, make sure you have your mic off at home, please. Thanks. A difficult ethical decision situation has inherent in it opportunities. And, I'm ta and I'll talk about this more, but these are opportunities to uh, build your reputation, to set high standards, to guide who you are and who you're becoming. So these are the opportunities. Um, the purpose of this kind of framework, these four questions, is um, not necessarily to point out that there's a, 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 an obvious yes or no answer to a difficult ethical decision situation. Uh, it's not going to be obvious whether to steal the bread or not steal the bread, but it, it, um, the, the purpose is to help you think through the ethical situation so that at the end you have a decision, uh, you've arrived at a decision that you can own and that you can defend, that you can be proud of. So that's the purpose of this. So let's talk about four questions with respect to the Houston Astros. This first question follows directly from that duties idea that I talked about earlier, the idea that um, you need to be aware of the widely held strong moral expectations on you, that you would be considered irresponsible if you didn't follow them. Society is chock full of expectations, moral rules for your behavior. Some of those expectations come by virtue of you simply being a human being and living on this planet. And um, other uh, rules are more specific to you. Maybe they follow from your occupation, your profession, the, the, the status you have in society, the power you have, the privilege that you have, um, the information advantages you have, and so forth. So um, some of these uh, expectations are formal. They're written down, they're in rules and laws and codes of conduct, and some of them are tacit, meaning that they, they're not written down, they're just, they just exist uh, in terms of understandings that we have between each other as people. These um, expectations are uh, held in common. We hold them in, um, in societies, uh, in organizations, in our professions, in our communities, whether they be local communities or national or world communities, uh, these expectations are socially held. So we need to recognize um, as part of this ethical decision-making framework, what the expectations are on us, 
recognizing that sometimes there'll be conflicting expectations uh, that are not easy to meet. And sometimes we won't actually like the expectations that we're under. We may see them as misplaced or, or too narrow. So what about uh, the Astros? And well, what about if we ask this question, uh, did they meet their, uh, their moral obligations, their, mor their moral expectations? This gets a little confusing, frankly, because we can separate the tacit and the explicit expectations on the Astros. What's really interesting about the situation is that the tacit understanding in baseball, believe it or not, is that sign stealing is okay. It's completely okay. Under the condition where the sign is stolen by a runner who's on base. The runner's on base and he's looking at the catcher. And if, if the runner can decode the sign and communicate it through some kind of gesture to the batter, that traditionally has been considered to be fair play and what's allowed in baseball. However, in contrast to that, the explicit rules in baseball, the written down rules, the ones that everybody knows are that you cannot use, you're not allowed to use technology, whether it be mechanical technology or electronic technology to steal signs. This is, a, this is an interesting contrast because it's hard to find a strong underlying logic that ties these two together, the tacit understanding and the explicit understanding. It doesn't seem to have a strong logic that underlies both. And this is a really nice lesson, by the way, for organizations, because uh, when there are rules, whether they're tacit or explicit, there really should be an, a, 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 a logical reason for those rules that people can understand and that they can adhere to the underlying reason as well as to the overlaying rules. And when and, and the, the tacit understandings and the explicit rules both have to reflect those that underlying logic. Otherwise, people will treat it as if it's hypocrisy and, and window dressing, and it will be hard to get compliance. One interesting note about thinking about where your where the moral expectations lie is if you completely follow the expectations, the moral expectations it's possible that no one will really notice. It's only when you don't that they notice. You don't draw attention by fulfilling expectations, but you draw a considerable amount of attention from not following expectations. So uh, there are and can be severe interpersonal social consequences for not following through with, um, with moral expectations you'll be in the spotlight. You'll draw derision from people. You'll lose friends, you'll lose partners, you'll lose business partners, investors, employees. You may get fired. You may lose your freedom if you end up in prison. So a good rule of thumb when you're trying to think of in the situation, if you're trying to think out a situation and say, will I be fulfilling my moral expectations is will, you, will people be mad at me? Will People try to punish me while they seek retribution. It's a very easy rule of thumb. It's one that the Astros could have considered. So what about the Astros? Should they have anticipated that people would be angry? I'm gonna say yes. And let's just look at the fallout from this sign stealing scandal. They were fined $5 million. Now, it may occur to you that that's actually not a large amount of money for such a, a wealthy, organization. It's the maximum that was allowed by contract for them to be fined. Probably more, much more painful is the fact that they've forfeited now their first and second round draft picks for the next two years. And if you're not familiar with that means, um, it means that they have lost the opportunity to uh, acquire the best new players for their team. And it will hurt their prospects for the future. In addition to that, they're the top people, the manager and general manager of the team were suspended and then fired. Players who would have otherwise had promotional opportunities in baseball have lost those opportunities. What about the impact on players? This is interesting because in exchange for their cooperation and testimony, players were given immunity. In other words, they can't be prosecuted 
and they can, and the league won't seek any kind of punishment. Um, but they also have a strong reputational uh, impact because if you if you followed the spring training before it got suspended this year, you saw that the Astros were getting taunted and harassed at by fans at the fields. And um, we would expect that if baseball resumes, this will continue throughout the season and maybe long into the future. It will not be easy on these players. What about on the team and on the league and on the game? If, if, um, if the team, the league, the game loses fan support, if, it's, if it suffers from the idea that there's a loss of integrity, uh, this could have a long-term impact on the game. There's also some lawsuits, some players who felt that they lost games and lost opportunities in baseball. Uh, some, some even their career got shortened, they believe. They, some of those players are suing Major League Baseball and the Astros. There's also lawsuits by gamblers uh, who felt that they, had, they were operating under false information. So yes, lots of fallout, people were angry. And, um, and when, again, we're, we're thinking about this question, am I meeting moral expectations? Could the Astros have asked themselves this question, considered the, the, how angry people would be if it came to light and still gotten past this question? It's hard to imagine they could have done so, but if they did, then they'd get to the second question in our guide. The second question is, Am I achieving moral outcomes? And notice how that first question followed from the duties idea for moral philosophy. And this question follows from the consequences idea. So here, we're not thinking about what, our, what the rules for behavior are, but rather we're just figuring out who's affected, who is affected by your actions, by your behavior, and who's helped and, who, and who's harmed. We have to think about not only direct stakeholders, the people who are directly affected by our actions, but the fact that our actions that have direct effects on some parties will have indirect effects on other parties. And we have to think about not only short-term consequences, but also longer-term consequences. It's not possible to optimize benefits to everybody affected in both the short and long-term. So a good decision maker tries to think out the best balance, trying to create the most help for the most number of people. Best balance between help achieved and harm caused. So let's think through this with the Astros. Um, I listed a quick list of some of the affected parties. And these are mainly direct parties that were affected and not thinking about indirect parties, but who was affected, certainly the Astros players. Um, we have to acknowledge that the Astro players at least initially had a huge status gain. Winning the World Series is the pinnacle of Major League Baseball in the world, and it is, um, uh, it is a huge status gain. That can degrade pretty fast, though, when people start thinking that it was the result of cheating. The financial gain was significant for the players, uh, for the team, um, so the, the, the Astros players and the people who depend upon them financially, they all benefited financially. Same with the Astros managers in the short run. And then to the extent that they lose jobs and opportunities in Major League Baseball, not in the long run. Astros managers, maybe short-term financial gain, who knows long-term. What about opponents, people who got beat because they were cheated? They're, they're stakeholders. What about other professional baseball players who weren't even opponents of the Astros and the idea that they are affected if there's a loss of integrity, a loss of fan support for the game? What about other people in the baseball industry, thinking about ticket sellers and hot dog vendors and umpires and uh, media representatives and all the people that uh, are peripheral to this industry? How, how they could be negatively affected. What about Astros fans who were initially delighted, maybe not so now? Baseball fans in general who, who uh, lose faith in the game. What about gamblers? I mentioned them before, but they have an interest in, in, the, in, in, they're affected by the cheating as well. So these are all affected parties. These are mainly drug parties and then the direct effect on these 
parties also has direct effect, indirect effects on the people down the chain who depend upon, upon them at will. So when we do an analysis of, this, of analysis of this situation and we think about who the affected parties were in this situation, and we say, where's the help and where's the, where's the harm and what's the balance of help and harm? It seems like there's a lot more harm than help. And it's hard to imagine that if the Astros thought about this question in advance and thought about, um, thought about how do I achieve, even my achieving moral outcomes, that they could have gotten past this question and still thought this was a good idea. But if they did, they'd get to our next question. Now notice we've switched now from obligations to opportunities. And again, this is the idea that inherent in any kind of difficult ethical decision situation are in fact opportunities. Um, and the first would be the opportunity to surpass what's required. This is the idea that with, with, with not fulfilling your obligations, as I pointed out before, can drive people from you, can ruin relationships, can ruin opportunities for you. But when, when you surpass what's required, you can actually draw people to you. You can build reputation. You can set standards for people. Um, you can make people feel less vulnerable in acting with you, in, in acting, um, in, in depending upon you. You can, um, I guess what I'm gonna point out is that by always looking to surpass what's required, you, you don't operate on the edge of what's appropriate and inappropriate. So there's a lot less chance that you're gonna be inadvertently straying into immoral behavior or bad behavior. So this, this whole question is about taking a difficult situation and looking at it as an opportunity to build trust with others. Now, when we think about the Astros, uh, I thought one way of thinking about how the Astros might have got, gone above and beyond, exceeded expectations, surpassed what people expected in terms of duties and expectations. Uh, I thought about this high school golfer from South Dakota, Kate, uh, Kate Winja, who, uh, this is a story from last year. And I've got a little video here. I hope it comes through well. Let's see. So, Kate, you made national headlines this week when you very admirably self-reported the writing down the wrong score on your card, which cost you and your team a state golf title. Can you just take me through the decision that you and your coach made to, to self-report on this? Yeah, I had gotten off the green, and it was pretty exciting because my team – um, was so excited to win and I mean I was excited too and my coach it's his last year and we've been together since seventh grade so that was pretty incredible and um, then about five to ten minutes later after the scores had been put up I looked at my own card and the score on the board and they didn't match up um, so I knew that on the last hole I had had a five and not a four but on the official card it said four so I went and found my coach and we went and found the directors and told them what had happened. Now, what has the reaction been like from the rest of your team, from the other schools and from everyone in the golf world? It's crazy. Um, <laughs> the outpour of support is, is crazy. Um, I never thought that it would have gotten this far. The stuff from Kate's so good. She got a shout out from Golden Bear. Jack mm. Nichols, the greatest golfer ever this week. Check out the tweet from Jack. I love the uniquely special characteristics of the game of golf, even when it is sometimes tough love. Congrats to this young lady for using golf as a vehicle to teach us life lessons on honesty and integrity. Did we know that the uh, that, that came through, the audio came through for everybody? It did, okay. So, I think what Kate is showing us here is the difference between playing the game of golf or playing the game of baseball or the game of business or the game of life with foresight and integrity or instead playing as the lowest common denominator. I think that if the Astros had thought about this question about um, going, going beyond what's, um, what's expected that uh, and thinking about this as an opportunity to build trust and to build reputation, it's hard to imagine that they could have gotten past this particular question and still thought the sign stealing scandal 
was a good idea. Student science grant scheme was a good idea. But if they had, they would have gotten to our, our fourth question, which is, am I aligning my behavior with my own values? And, um, and this, is a, um, this is the idea that within any, any kind of difficult ethical decision situation, there's an opportunity to shape your own identity and your own character. Uh, this is a very personal level question. It's about your own commitments to yourself and to your own, and to your own beliefs, what, what's meaningful to you in life, where you see the difference between right and wrong. Uh, if you align your behavior with your own values, no one may notice, uh, but this is about being able to live with yourself, being able to sleep well at night, um, being proud of who you're becoming. And if you're making decisions on behalf of an organization, being proud of what the organization is becoming. But what about the Astros? How would they approach this question? How, how would they answer this question? I thought it might be helpful to uh, hear from a couple of players themselves. So we're gonna do a little more video. Here we have a very short video of Alex Bregman and Jose Altuve. I have some brief remarks that I'd like to share with y'all. I am really sorry about the choices that were made by my team, by the organization, and by me. I have learned from this, and I hope to regain the trust of baseball fans. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Alex. Uh, I also will be brief. We had a great uh, team meeting last night, and I want to say that the whole Astros organization and the team uh, feel bad about what happened in, in 2017. <clears throat> we especially feel remorse for the impact in our fans and the gain of baseball. Were those sincere, heartfelt, apologies or were they just going through the motions? There's been a lot of discussion about that since this so-called apology press conference. And um, it's really hard to say from an outsider's perspective. We don't really know um, if they're embarrassed, if they can sleep well at night, if they feel remorseful for what they did, or maybe they're just mad about being caught. And that's an interesting point about this last uh, this last question, aligning your behavior with your values, it's not easy to assess from the outside. It just shows you how personal this question is. So these are the four questions in the guide for ethical decision making. Um, and again, the idea is that uh, it helps you think through a dilemma. If it's a complicated one, like will I steal the bread to feed my starving family, then this helps you think it through. If it's a more obvious question, like the Houston Astros question, that kind of helps you see that, how obvious it is. But we have to recognize that being a good decision maker, especially when the situation has such strong, um, so, such strong reasons to push you in the wrong direction, being a good decision maker can be very challenging. Uh, if you're thinking about the Astros and the enormous um, rewards that they got for winning the World Series, they might have been subject to some possible rationalizations. One of them is this greater good rationalization where they, they may have thought to themselves, okay, I'm doing something bad, but, um, but with the wealth and status and, and, um, and platform I get by being a World Series champion, I can do so much good. I can do good for my family and my friends and for my community and for society. The greater good outweighs the bad I'm doing. Or maybe they sugarcoated the language. Uh, this whole idea of sign stealing it's such an ugly word. It's got the word stealing right in it. But when you listen to some of their press conferences, they didn't use that word. They talked about being a very competitive team and using competitive tactics, sugar-coated language. What about false comparisons? Um, some of them said, hey, everybody's cheating. People are cheating more than we are. We weren't as bad as others. That's making a false comparison. What about minimizing the facts? Even the Houston Astros owner said in one of the press conferences, I believe that it had no impact on the game. It had no impact on the game. That's minimizing effects. Um, it's easy to think that when you're an opponent, when you have an opponent in, in a sporting competition, that um, it's easy to minimize their, their fairness to them and deny them the, the, the courtesy of treating them well. 
offloading responsibility. It's easy to think that the players offloaded the responsibility to the managers. They might have, and reasonably so, as it turns out, thought that if this whole thing came out and um, it became exposed in public, that it would be the managers who got in trouble. And in fact, that's what happened. But even just being in a big group who's making a bad decision, no one person feels responsible for the decision. Uh, fully responsible. So we feel we have this diffusion of responsibility, spread responsibility when we're in a group. And, and the last rationalization that they might have fallen prey to is blaming the victims and saying, hey, if they're so stupid, meaning the opponents, that they can't figure out what we're doing, well, then it's their own fault. These are all rationalizations that the Houston Astros probably fell into and that we fall into when, when there's an obvious right decision, but we fall into the wrong decision. And given how easy it is to rationalize, it might be nice to figure out if there's a way to determine whether or not we've made a good decision or a bad decision. And here, I'm just going to give you four quick tests. Uh, the first test is the visibility test. This is probably the most widely known of the quick ethical decision test. It's basically, would you be happy if your decision was on the front page of the newspaper tomorrow morning? This is, um, by the way, Warren Buffett's favorite ethical decision test. He says, would I be, he asks himself, would I be happy if, if everybody knows my conflicts of interest and the process I went through and the decision that I made, what if that was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal tomorrow morning? Would I still be proud of it? Other people talk about it as the mother test. Would I be, would I be proud to tell everything to my mother? Does your decision stand up this, to this kind of visibility? One thing is, uh, to recognize is what a great test this is of the, of the first question, the, the um, in my meeting expectations question, because if your decision becomes visible and you know people are going to be very mad at you, then you know you failed that test. And we would expect that if the Astros had thought this out, they would have realized how dramatically they would fail this visibility test. The second test is... Um, the veil of ignorance test. It's a thought experiment where you recognize there's so many people who are affected by your decision, but you, you lower the veil and you pretend you don't know which of the people you are, which of the affected parties you are. You don't know if you're an opponent, a fan, a gambler, maybe a little leaguer who has an interest in the sport in general, or any other party that's affected. And then you make your decision. Yes, we'll engage in the sign stealing scheme. And then you raise the veil and you find out, oh, I'm the opponent, or oh, I'm a fan, or oh, I'm a gambler, or whatever. And the idea is, does your decision still stand up? Does it still seem right, fair, justifiable? If the Astros had done this veiled ignorance test, it's very unlikely that they could have passed it because the only people who really benefit are the, are the, narrow, the narrow interest of the Astros, and maybe even only in the short term. The third test is what we call the generalizability test. Does your decision generalize in such a way that what you're doing, you'd be happy if everybody did it. Everybody in your situation did it from now on. What would that do to society? And would that be the kind of society that you want to live in? Does your, does your decision generalize in that way? What about the Astros? Would they be happy if everybody cheated in baseball, if cheating was widespread in baseball? One of the dangers is that it degrades the whole integrity of the sport, something like what happened to, in professional cycling, where doping was so widespread that people just lost uh, faith in the sport as having integrity. And, and my last test then is the legacy test. The legacy test is about who are you becoming? Who, what does this say about you in the long run? Is this what you want to be remembered for? I like to use Pat Tillman uh, as an example of legacy. As you know, he was a, um, a well-known football player here at ASU who became a famous uh, player in the National Football League and then um, dramatically gave up his lucrative career after the 9-11 terrorist attacks to join the military and then was killed in friendly fire. And we remember Pat Tillman as somebody of great principle and great integri integrity. What about the Astros? Uh, what about their legacy and the idea that, yes, they're probably going to get to keep their World Series title, but forever they're going to have that symbolic asterisk next to it. Forever it's going to be, yeah, but they cheated. This is the legacy. And so this is the, the guide to ethical decisions, these four questions and these four tests. Again, the purpose of it is to help you think through a question in four, from four different angles. 
uh, to arrive at a decision that you can be proud of, that you can own, that you can defend. Um, but all this talk about baseball and suddenly, shockingly, uh, baseball stadiums are right now completely quiet and completely empty. And we've got something a lot more important on our minds. And so it, very briefly, I just wanted to say a few words about um, some thoughts based on what we talked about in this presentation today about ethics in the time of pandemic. And I wanna continue along the lines of the presentation by talking about us as the decision makers. We could talk about the ethics of government or business or health organizations or all these different levels I have a lot to talk about, but I wanna talk about us as, as individuals and, and decision makers. And I wanna point out that, and this goes without saying, that right now we are under, we are under a considerable amount of stress. And we all are to one degree or another. And it is exactly this stress that has baked within it certain obligations and certain opportunities. So I wanted to talk about that for just a minute. Let's talk about the, um, let's talk about the obligations first. And I would just point out that when we're under stress, we tend to circle the wagons. We tend to turn in somewhat. We, we protect those, we protect ourselves. We protect those who are close to us. We de-emphasize the needs of people who are outside of our circle and especially the people who are strangers to us. I'm not saying that we become entirely selfish. It's just that we have more of a tendency under stress to, to, to turn inward, to be a little less sensitive to uh, to um, the inside lives of others in contrast to, to ourselves. And you can see this right now in society when you, when you see behaviors like, um, like uh, hoarding and uh, jeopardizing the health and safety of, of vulnerable others by flouting uh, public health and safety recommendations, for example, congregating in public. So it's Pretty easy to sum up what our obligations are um, in the time of pandemic when we realize that we do have this tendency to turn inward and that's simply to fight against that and do the opposite and realize how much people are, are counting on us. Uh, these are people who we know well, people we know a little bit and people we don't know at all. There are a lot of people who are in fact counting on us, counting on us to consume wisely, to comply with public health recommendations to actively seek out and help people who are vulnerable. And practically speaking, these are just a few ideas that I came up with. Uh, and uh, I would for ask you to join me in donating money right now to your local food bank. You can do that today, right after the presentation is over. It's very simple to do online. There are a lot of people in need and there are gonna be a lot more people in need very quickly. This is something practical you can do right now. Reach out to your higher risk neighbors. There may be people who um, are unable to shop for themselves or able to pick up their medications uh, that might have other needs. Stock up on your supplies, but then stop consuming. Um, if you have a three or four week supply uh, of goods, then you're fine. Uh, try to avoid the, the tendency to disaster hoard. And of course, comply with public health directives. Those are obligations, but it's important to recognize that we also have a strong opportunity with the stress that we're under. And the primary opportunity as I see it is to recognize this as a defining moment for ourselves. Um, the stress and how we react to it, how we act will reveal to us information about ourselves. It will, reveal, it will reveal to ourselves what our values truly are, the strength of our commitment to our beliefs and goals. And importantly, how we act, how we react to the stress will, will shape ourselves into the future. It will, um, it will set uh, expectations for for ourselves. It will set a precedent. It will it will for for into the future define how we think about ourselves and how others think about us. So that's my concluding thought for today. That 
this, um, the, when we think about ethics in the pandemic, we can think about that we have strong obligations, strong obligations to realize how much people are counting on us to fight the tendency to turn completely inward and to look outward, but also to think of the opportunity here, the opportunity to build and define ourselves, to um, be in charge of who we are and who we're becoming. So that's all I have to say today. So, and thank you. Thanks for joining me. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Don Lang, for an incredibly thoughtful and uh, introspective presentation. Um, I think it's something that gives us a lot to think about. Um, to give you all just kind of an idea of what will happen next. Um, first of all, to our alumni who joined us for the Back to Class event, I am putting some information into the chat box right now. Um, so just a huge thanks for coming back uh, to, for those of you, I'm sure many of you had Don uh, in your program, so it's probably nice to hear from him again. And if you didn't, um, now you're lucky enough to have, to have heard from him too. Uh, so I put a note in here, if you have any questions about how to stay engaged or any questions whatsoever for the alumni relations team, I've put the Director of Alumni Relations, Brennan Force's email right into the chat box. Um, so definitely re reach out to her if you do have, um, have anything. So we're going to take a short break um, and then pop back up at 11.30. Our sessions are going to start at 11.35. Um, so the first session, again, um, will be one of these four options here. I'm going to also put these into the chat box again for you, so you can just follow those links directly. Um, but again, we'll be doing these three 20-minute sessions. And, oh, perfect, we do have that screen. Excellent. So um, there's Brennan's email again for any questions whatsoever that you have. And then we will leave the, um, the agenda slide up so that uh, if you stay in this room or if you need to run out for just a second, you can do so. Um, but then again, please join us back in just a couple minutes at um, the next, next breakout session. So I'll paste all of those into the chat box as well. And uh, we thank you again, huge thanks again to Don Lang. Thank you all.